Hi, and welcome to Conservator's Corner. This is a video series about the care and research of the collection of the Detroit Institute of Art. I'm Chris Foster, the Conservator of Art on Paper and Photographs at the DIA. Here at the DIA, we have conservation labs devoted to the care of paintings, objects, art on paper, and textiles. To aid in the research and treatment of our collection, we also have a conservation scientist, an imaging specialist, a mount fabricator, and a paper care specialist and assistant. The conservation department is a busy place, and each conservator generally has several projects in progress at the same time. Today, I'd like to virtually welcome you to the Paper Conservation Lab. In this image, you can see two Indian miniature paintings on the workbench. Um, they are here for examination and treatment, and they'll be uh, exhibited in uh, September of 2020. Some of the tools you see on the, the table include spatulas, tweezers, scissors, scalpels. Um, I have a, a variety of brushes that I use. We have cotton swabs. Uh, there's a small palette of dry pigments, and then we have some adhesives and weights as well. These are the tools that I tend to use on a nearly daily basis. Now on the far table under the map of Venice, you can see the stereo microscope, which has a, a digital camera attached to it. And this is what I use for close in work. Um, the blue apparatus up above is an articulating fume extraction trunk. And this is used when I work with toxic solvents to avoid breathing them. Uh, the presentation was originally delivered as part of a workshop at the DIA with the FBI art crime and evidence recovering teams back in 2019. We really enjoyed working with the agents and I think both the conservators and agents learned a lot from one another. So our presentation will begin with some basics about what we can learn by looking at works of art on paper with different types of lighting. Then there will be information about paper history and fiber sources, followed by handmade paper manufacture. We'll conclude with the examination of Italian drawing from 1650. So this is my examination go kit. I have all these items with me in the paper lab and I also take them with me when I have to look at something in the galleries or down in storage, or even if I go off site. So what we have is a five times magnification head loop. Um, I have a rechargeable LED hand lamp um, I like to bring along an ultraviolet hand lamp as well. And then I'll bring one or both of these spatulas. Uh, these are used to lift up the corner of a sheet if I want to look at the back of a drawing or a print. And finally, uh, nitrile examination gloves. Um, we wear these when we're handling art on art, any kind of art really, because we don't want to um, transfer the oils and salts from our skin onto the works of art. So, I use lighting from four di different directions to learn about the work of art I'm examining. Um, I use flat or normal light for the initial examination. Uh, raking light or light from the side is shined parallel to the uh, surface of the paper and it, it throws the uh, texture of the paper into relief and any planar distortions. Transmitted light is light from behind. Uh, we call it look through as well and shows the paper structure and thinned, lost, or replaced areas. Uh, usually my light source for transmitted light is a light table, and I just put the, the work of art on the light table. Finally, we have specular light. This is light that's um, bounced off the surface of the, the work of art, and the observer is looking back towards the light source. So this tends to show matte versus shiny areas, and it can also reveal coatings such as varnish or fixatives. So we're going to look now at a, um, a drawing by Henry Matisse. It's a pencil on a spiral bound notebook pad paper from 1952. The title is Study for Blue Nude. Uh, it's on a sheet about eight, uh, 10 and a half by eight inches um, and it's a graphite pencil. Um, this, <clears throat> the sketch was done in preparation for his Blue Nude series, and you see uh, that at the right side of the screen. This is one of his cutouts. The cutouts were painted paper that were cut with scissors and then uh, adhered to paper, which was then mounted on canvas. And the one we see here is actually about 46 by 35 inches, and it belongs to the Pompidou Center in Paris. So here we have the, comp the comparison of the uh, Matisse sketch under normal light 
and also under raking light. And I think you'll agree with me that we can really gain a lot of information about the condition of the sheet from the raking light image. So I guess I'd like to draw your attention first to the, the uh, crescent shaped dimples at the right side of the sheet at the center. Uh, paper conservators call these kinds of creases handling creases and they're caused when someone picks up the sheet at a, at a limited area and manipulates it. So considering that this um, drawing was in a, in a sketchbook, we shouldn't be surprised to find these handling creases at the right edge because this is where the pages would have been turned. And I like to think that most of these are probably caused by Matisse himself as he paged through his, uh, his drawings. Next, I'd like to have you take a look at the top corners of the drawing. Um, there's two rectangular distortions, and these are caused by the hinges. Um, I ended up removing the, these hinges and lightly um, humidifying and flattening the upper corners and then putting in hinges that would not cause distortions. And finally, and this is a little bit harder to see perhaps, um, I'd like you to take a look at the very lightly incised lines that echo the drawn pencil lines in the drawing. Um, you can see some at the area of the raised knee. There's a few to the left of the head. Um, there's some in between the torso and the arm, the lowered arm, and there are some above the shoulder upper right. So what these are, um, these are remnants of the drawings that Batiste did on the pages preceding the one we're looking at right now. Um, the pressure of his pencil on the paper went through one or two pages and left its mark on this page. So it's pretty interesting that we have our pencil drawing, but we also have basically the residue of the two previous drawings on this page. Um, for our transmitted light example, we're looking at an engraving by Albrecht Dürer, the German Renaissance artist. This engraving is from 1496, and the subject is St. Jerome Penitent. We have the, draw, uh, the uh, engraving on a light table, so the light's coming up from behind the sheet, and you can see the two dark areas at the upper corners. So these are old hinge residues that are still attached to the back of the sheet, and since the paper is thicker there, it's darker. Um, you can also see some light areas at the top edge and also along the um, center of the right edge. These are skinned areas of the print where fibers have been scraped away or removed from, from damage or possibly from removing old hinges. And finally, uh, if you look at the detail at the lower right, there's a, a watermark there. And if you turn your head a little bit to the side and look at it, you may be able to tell that it's a, a one-handled pot or a pitcher. Um, I'll be talking more about watermarks a little bit later on. So finally, um, specular light. Here we have a drawing by uh, Diego Rivera. It's one of our Rivera cartoons that was done as a study for the Rivera murals that he did here in 1933, the D Detroit Industry Series. Um, what we're looking at is um, uh, red pigment and black vine charcoal that he's used to delineate this face. And the very shiny area of the face is a locally applied fixative. And the reason he used the fixative was probably to avoid muddying up or being able to go back in and, and draw on top of areas which he'd already worked. This, this prevents the drawing from getting muddy. And you can see the contours of the eyes, the nostrils, and the lips are, are quite matte on top of the shiny fixative. So paper basics, what exactly is paper? Paper is mechanically beaten or macerated plant fibers mixed with water. The water fiber slurry is cast onto a screen, allowing the water to drain. The sheet of fibers is then pressed and dried. So paper is actually a pretty simple material. Um, it's alleged to have been invented in China in 105 AD by a court official named Sai Lun. And the Chinese court paper was used mostly for record keeping and its manufacture was a closely guarded secret. Uh, this may explain why it took a thousand years for the technology to spread from China to Europe. 
Here we have a map of the spread of paper, paper making across Asia to the Middle East and on to Europe. It begins with Siloon in China in the lower right corner. The technology moves west through China along the Silk Road, arriving at Samarkand in present day Uzbekistan in Central Asia by the year 751, and that's above India and the Arabian Sea there. And it arrives in Baghdad by 793, a little to the west. Um, by the 10th century, the paper making of technology arrives at the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea in Damascus and Cairo. Um, it arrives in Spain by 1151 and in Italy by 1276 and traveled to Northern Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. The first known paper manufacturer in North America was in Philadelphia in 1690. So a little about paper fiber sources. What are the sources of these cellulose fibers? Uh, traditionally, they're made from locally sourced materials. In Asia, they tend to be made of the inner bark of shrubs, such as the paper mulberry or mitsumata or gampi plants. They also used hemp fibers, bamboo fibers, and rice straw in Asia. In the Mideast, linen and cotton rags were favored, as well as hemp and flax fibers. In Europe, they tended to use just linen and cotton rags. This was until the, um, the 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century, when the paper making machine was invented and the rag supply couldn't keep up with the demand. So paper makers began experimenting and they ended up discovering that um, cellulose fibers from wood could be used to make paper. This would be either ground wood or chemically processed wood pulp. And even today, uh, wood pulp is what our, our paper is made of for the most part. So European hand paper making. Um, the, the way it worked was rags were collected and sorted. They were washed and degreased and then beaten and macerated into pulp. And if you look at the print on the left here, you can see the, the stamping mill, the hammer mill in the background through the open doorway. There are actually hammers that go up and down uh, run by a, a camshaft and that's um, hooked up to a water wheel outside. And if you look at the print on the right, you can also see in the a background at left the, um, the hammer mill and out the window you can see the, the blades of the water wheel. So once the, the, the rags were pulped, they were added to water in a large vat and stirred. A worker, the vat man, dipped the paper making mold into the vat and let it drain briefly. And in the print at the left, you can see the uh, vatman lifting the mold out of the vat, and it looks like he's got a freshly cast sheet of paper on his paper making mold. He would then hand the mold off to another worker who stacked sheets on wool felt, interleaving the sheets with felts. This is the kutcher, and he's the fellow with his back towards us, and you can see he's got the paper making mold upside down, and he's rolling the freshly cast sheet onto a stack of felts and sheets of paper. Um, the stack was then removed, what was it, I'm sorry, the stack was then pressed to remove water in a large screw press. And you can see an example of a screw press again in the print on the right hand side behind the, uh, the vatman. The sheets were then separated from the felts by the layman, stacked and pressed again, and drying was completed in a drying loft. So it turns out that paper making is not so simple after all. This is a paper making mold. Um, it's in two parts. Above we have the decal, which sits on the, the mold, and this acts as a frame and it keeps the uh, fibers from running off the edge of the mold after it when it's drawn out of the vat, out of the, uh, the, the paper fiber slurry. The mold itself is a wooden frame it has wooden ribs running from top to bottom vertically, and then across the ribs and attached to them are very fine metal wires. And it's the surface of the metal wires that actually is what the, uh, the sheet of paper is cast upon. This is a detail of a paper making mold. You can see there's a watermark on it. Um, we see our laid wires running horizontally right to left, 
and we can see two wooden ribs running vertically. And you can see there's an even finer wire that um, acts as a, a spacer for the uh, laid wires, and it's also attached to the ribs. And on the right, we're looking from the underneath of the paper making mold, and you can see sort of a chain stitch at the top of the ribs. And this again spaces the um, laid wires out, and then you can see the wires that are um, that go through the, the ribs that attach the uh, the laid surface to the to the ribs. So, this is a sheet of antique laid paper, uh, seen with transmitted light, and next to it is our example of our paper, paper making mold. So, with the transmitted light, we can see our ch vertical chain chain lines running up and down the sheet. The chain lines have a slight shadow at their edge, and this is caught by, caused by capillary action of the water draining from the mold. You can see the closely spaced vertical lines of the laid wires running from right to left, and we also have a beautiful watermark right in the middle of the, the image. Um, the watermark would have been of wire as well and sewn on top of the laid wires. This one happens to be a Strasbourg lily, so the sheet would have been from eastern France. Um, basically, we have the lily centered on a shield and surmounted by a crown. So this is a comparison of transmitted light and raking light of this same antique laid sheet. And you can see a lot of the characteristics of the sheet are visible with the raking light as well as with transmitted. In the, tr in the raking light shot, we can see our vertical chain lines, we can see our horizontal laid lines, and we also can see the watermark. So in Britain in the mid 18th century, they began to replace the thinly spaced uh, wires with a woven brass screen. Um, this gave a paper with a much smoother texture, which was ideal for printing books. And um, this became really the, the most popular type of paper on through the uh, end of the 18th and into the 19th century. And contemporary papers are pretty much strictly made on wove paper molds. Um, I just wanted to add that it's interesting that this wove mold in Britain in the 18 or seven, around 1757 um, is similar to an ancient Chinese paper making technique in which the paper was cast on woven silk. And here we have a raking light photograph of a wove paper, and I think you can get a sense of the screen pattern from the raking light photograph and adjacent to it is the detail of the, uh, the, the wove paper making mold. Uh, just a few words about Asian papers. This is an Asian paper seen with uh, transmitted light on the left and raking light on the right. You can see Asian papers as well have chain and laid lines. The, um, in China, the, um, the laid lines are caused by very uh, thin slats of bamboo that's sewn together with horsehair. So that's what causes the, uh, the laid and chain lines there. <clears throat> On the right side, we see a, a raking light shot of the surface of the sheet. Um, China, or Asian papers were dried on, on large sheets of metal and they were brushed onto the metal to dry them. So what we're seeing here is the, the, the brush marks from the stiff bristle brush that was used to put the uh, sheet of paper onto the metal drying surface. So we're going to finish up our presentation today uh, by examining a uh, Italian drawing from 1650 by the artist Squarcino. Um, the title is Studies for Assumption of the Virgin. It's red chalk on antique pa laid paper. It's about 12 by 8 and 3 quarters inches, and we acquired it in 2016. It's a double sided drawing. So here we have the back side. Um, so on the left, we have the, the Virgin held up by two angels and sur surrounded at the top by little cherubs, which are just barely indicated. You can see the artist is really thinking through his composition at this point. Um, the, the figures of the angels are not distinct and they have, you know, multiple limbs and some of the heads are the head is pointed in different directions. Um, this is in comparison to the uh, cherub drawing, which is a highly finished drawing.
So we were very excited to acquire this drawing because it was a preparatory study for a painting that's already in the collection that we acquired in 1972, where Chino's Assumption of the Virgin. So here we see a comparison of the painting, which is actually quite a bit larger than it looks there, and the, uh, the front and back of the drawing. And you can see the little cherub at upper right is quite similar to the one in the painting, whereas you see a lot of changes between the uh, preliminary drawing and the finished oil painting. So this is a raking light shot of the front of the drawing. Um, you can see some distortions in, in the sheet. These are actually fairly typical of handmade sheets, and we don't consider this to be a problem or a flaw. Um, next to it, we have the um, transmitted light shot, a detail of the center of the drawing. So we see our paper structure quite clearly. We have our vertical chain lines with their shadows. We have our laid lines running from right to left. We can also see a watermark um, below and right of center. And there is a dead center. There's a brown stain with a lighter center. I think someone tried to treat the stain by maybe removing some of the paper fibers from it. And I think that's why it looks the way it does now. Um, I also want to point out that since this is transmitted light, we can also see the drawing on the back of the uh, sheet. And so just below the um, Madonna's um, chin and shoulder, you can see the face of the, the cherub uh, with his eyes looking off to the right. So a few words about the watermark. This is a um, transmitted light photograph of the watermark in its proper orientation. Um, I have a series of um, catalogs of watermarks here in the uh, in the paper lab, and I was able to find one very similar to the uh, watermark in this sheet. It's a bird on three hills encircled. And according to the author of the catalog, um, he found this watermark in a document in Rome dated to the late 16th century. So even though our watermark is probably about 50 years after that, it still looks like it was a watermark from Rome. So I think we can be fairly um, confident that this, this is a Roman paper. Here we have the opening of the uh, the catalog. It's it's from uh, Briquet, Le Filigran, and you can see our little uh, bird on his three hills at the lower left corner here of this opening of the sheets. Um, the facing page has uh, bears, which follow birds alphabetically in French. Um, as to the martini glass at top center, I really don't know why that's there. So here we have a comparison of the detail of the transmitted light shot and also a detail of ultraviolet light. You can see there are um, two stains that are fluorescing. They look they look brown with normal light. They look kind of bright white with the uh, ultraviolet light. I think the larger stain at the center it was treated possibly with a solvent to try and diminish it since it's you know part it, it disturbs the um, the view of the the, the subject. The, the other stain is smaller, and I think they just left it alone, and I think that's why it appears to be brighter. So we're going to end up here with um, a raking light photograph of the detail of the cherub on the back. And again, the raking light shows us the vertical chain lines. You can just barely make out the, the watermark, which is um, in the area of the cherub's hand and forearm. Um, we're not seeing the laid lines because the light is traveling in the same direction as they are across the sheet from left to, to right. But if you take a close look at the shading of the red chalk, you can see the texture of the paper there. So that indicates the, uh, the laid lines. So I'd like to acknowledge a few people who helped me with this presentation. Um, special thanks to Aaron Steele for his support in guiding me through the creation of this presentation and also for video editing it. I'd like to thank Blair Bailey, our Mellon Fellow in Paintings Conservation, for breaking the ground to help get the Conservator's Corner started. Finally, um, thanks to FBI Special Agent Jake Archer, who made the DIA FBI Art Crime and Evidence Response Team workshop possible. I'd like to thank you for watching this video, video on looking at paper. I hope you enjoyed it. Be on the lookout for our next installment of Conservator's Corner. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in the museum soon. Thanks again.